Channel 8's Robert Riggs joins us now live from our Austin newsroom with more. Robert? Well, Gloria Ann Richards tried to refocus the questions that are damaging her campaign onto the honesty of her two opponents, Attorney General Jim Maddox and former Governor Mark White. Maddox has said not answering the drug use question could bring down the Democratic Party. Well, Richards came out swinging in an attack against Maddox and White's integrity. I've been sober for 10 years. Have Jim Maddox and Mark White been honest for 10 years? Ann Richards still refuses to give a yes or no answer to the question of whether she ever used illegal drugs. Richards, a recovering alcoholic, says she has not had a mood-altering chemical for a decade. If elected governor, she would be the official responsible for leading the drug Indeed war. Indeed, I would. What do you say to people, though, that are left with the impression that by declining to answer this question, yes or no, you're you're in effect taking the fifth or against self-incrimination. I have uh, seen any number of young people in programs in which I participate. I think that my experience in my hospitalization gives me far greater insight than any person would have in the problems that people face in their own families with alcoholism and drug addiction. And I think it prepares me very well. Uh, I feel really fortunate, truthfully, uh, that there was a treatment program for my disease. I wish there were a treatment program for meanness, and then maybe Maddox could get well. Richard says the drug question was never raised until she got in the way of, quote, these boys who wanted to be governor. She counterattacked the ethics of her opponent, Attorney General Jim Maddox. I think that it is time that we have an explanation from Jim Maddox about why he will not release his income tax. I think it is time that we have an explanation from him why it is that he can take such large gifts and large contributions and whether or not that affects his performance as the Attorney General of the state of Texas. Richards also questioned the integrity of her other chief opponent, former Governor Mark White, asking how can a former public servant afford a million dollar home in Houston and questioning whether he enriched himself while in office. Well, Richard says there are limits to what a human being should disclose about their personal life. Responding to an indirect question about drug use, Richard says she has not knowingly committed a felony. Richard says applicants for state troopers should not be excluded from hiring if they have used illegal drugs. Well, both the Maddox and White campaign say Richard's allegations are a desperate act to cover up why she can't answer the illegal drug use question. Gloria? Robert, do you think that Richard's campaign is sliding because of this uh, drug use controversy? I've talked to some of the people that are out in the counties running the campaign that are on the steering committees. They think it is sliding. They say the problem is it appears Ann Richards is not being straightforward. Tracy. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Legislators face a court-ordered May 1st deadline to come up with a measure to close the funding gap between rich and poor school districts. Channel Robert Riggs is in the state capitol now with the very latest. Robert, good evening. Well, Chip, the bill being debated here would spend uh, $450 million alone on equalization next year. It is similar to the bill that the House killed at the end of the first special session on school finance. And now it appears that this bill may be headed toward a defeat. Minority lawmakers say that they want more money spent in the first year, as much as $700 million. And uh, that would mean for certain a tax increase, which the governor is threatened to veto. Chip? Uh, Robert, you just mentioned that the chances for passage are uh, somewhat dim at this hour. Uh, what if this bill fails? What, uh, what happens then? If it fails, it's my understanding from, from the floor leadership that they would then come back with some bills and start ratcheting up the amount of money they would spend. But uh, then that's going to put them into a veto showdown with the governor. Gloria, I understand you have a question. Yes, I was just going to ask you, uh, if the governor does go ahead with his veto, what happens to the schools in the long run? Well, they're up against a May 1st deadline from the Supreme Court. Uh, Controller Bob Bullock says that if they have not complied with that deadline on May 1st, that he will not send out the state aid checks. And there are school districts around the state already worried that they'll have to shut down. And uh, some of the members here say they'll end up being the laughing stock of the nation. Gloria? Severe problems. Thanks a lot, Robert. The Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission is letting one of the nation's biggest brewing companies violate state liquor laws at SeaWorld. Critics say this is an example of how the agency known as the TABC plays favorites with the industry it's supposed to regulate. 
I'm not sure what's more shocking, the fact that Anheuser-Busch is selling beer illegally at SeaWorld or the fact that the TABC doesn't seem to mind too much. The Anheuser-Busch Brewing Company bought SeaWorld late last year. Under Texas law, a beer producer cannot own or operate a retail outlet. But SeaWorld continued to sell alcoholic beverages under its new ownership by Anheuser-Busch. Three months after the sale, the head of the TABC claimed he did not know about it. I don't have any information that's owned by someone other than what the original they've made. I don't even and have an no application. I understand they're in the process of purchasing it, but not yet. But the TABC's chief lawyer is allowing the violations while Anheuser Busch tries to change the law. The fact is that it is a, uh, a major attraction in the San Antonio area. They are not trying to thumb their nose at the state law or this agency. A former hearing officer at the TABC says selective law enforcement lends itself to favoritism. The general counsel's office takes the position that they can utilize uh, uh, what I call an Alice in Wonderland approach, that words mean what I say they mean. Anheuser-Busch is trying to fix its problem in the state legislature with an especially written emergency bill. It would allow for an exception in the law. It's not the first time we've done it. I'm sure it won't be the last time. The bill would allow SeaWorld to indefinitely sell alcoholic beverages under a caterer's permit. Yeah, this does have the appearance, though, that one big brewing company comes in Texas and gets a special deal that nobody that's else not is true. getting. No, that is absolutely not true. I think that it tells a lot about what the beer industry can get away with here in Texas. SeaWorld's beer bill is jokingly called the Sea Mammals Act, but it's no laughing matter for Anheuser-Busch. Some lawmakers and lobbyists are trying to get Governor Clements to include the SeaWorld beer bill in the special session on public school finance. Robert Riggs, Channel 8 News, Austin. Channel 8's Robert Riggs is there now with Star Cam 8. Robert? Well, Tracy, the first day of paramutual betting in Texas came to a close a few minutes ago with the 10th race. There have been 4,000 spectators here who braved rain, but it didn't dampen their spirits. Well, they bet approximately $180,000. Now, in comparison, there is $1.6 million wagered every day at Louisiana Downs. Well, a successful start here marks the start of a battle in the legislature to lower wagering taxes. I am fixing to buy a win ticket on every horse in this race, and that way I'll be able to say the rest of my life that I've won the first race. Betting on the first paramutual horse race in 52 years brought souvenir hunters and cash flush players to Brady. Legalized wagering is supposed to pump five cents of every dollar bet into the Texas Treasury. Opponents say paramutual racing made a sluggish start. Racing Commissioner James Clement, who opposed a license for G. Raleigh White Downs, now confesses he was wrong. Clement says Dallas will not get a large Class 1 track unless the lawmakers reduce the state tax. If they're not taken care of in November, you're probably looking at three years off. Because the next legislature won't meet for two years, and then it'll take at least a year to go through all the work and then build the track, it might be four years. And they're off and running. The opening of paramutual racing pleased racing commission officials. Although there were problems, such as the photo finish camera, it didn't always work. Coming on really easy magic with Hia Vike. Moving down the stretch, really easy magic. Hia Vike charging up on the outside. Hia Vike in front. A two-year-old quarter horse named Hia Vike sprinted 350 yards to win the first paramutual horse race since 1937. Joe Quintanilla of San Antonio says the wet track wasn't a factor. Well, he got in a little trouble away from there when he, when he first first 50 yards. Once I got him straight, he just opened up on him and I just sat on him and let him run the race on his own. And that was it. Well, he of Vike paid eight eighty on a two dollar bet to win. As you can see behind me, the grandstands are starting to empty out and people are headed home. Tracy. Hey, Robert, who did uh, turn up today? Was it uh, just locals or out of towners? Who was there? Well, it looked like a lot of locals. There was a sea of cowboy hats here. Now, some of the racing commission had been concerned that this track was just too isolated to draw a crowd, but there has been a long tradition here of quarter horse racing since 1947, and they are pleased with the turnout. The question is, is can they continue to consistently draw a large crowd like this in the future? 
And uh, Tracy, if you're wondering how your horses did, I've got your tickets here. <laughs> and uh, you may need a bet from John because no winners. All right, Robert, thanks a lot for the bad news. Now let's join Channel 8's Robert Riggs, who is with the Maddox campaign at this hour. Robert? Well, Chip, this race has drawn attention as one of the most vicious in the nation. In the primary, it started on the high road. That was when Jim Maddox was running ads, and you were the lottery candidate. You were talking about crime, drugs, education. But it, it appears to me that in the runoff, you abandoned those issues, and your spots went for the juggler with Ann Richards. Were you a desperate man, or did you think there was a character flaw there? Well, I think it was a character flaw that we had to address, uh, but what really happened was that when questions were raised about Ann Richards' illegal drug use, instead of attacking the media who asked the questions, she attacked Mark White and me. And then it kind of degenerated from there. But the question never was what kind of drugs she used. That was not the issue. The question was about the judgment of the individual that used the drugs. This weekend you were saying that you believe that she suffered multiple addictions, including cocaine. You're a former prosecutor. You, you never offered uh, any evidence to substantiate all this. Do you think you've hurt yourself in that regard by not doing that? Well, mutual friends of Ann Richards and I talked about it to me. And uh, if they'd wanted to come forward, they most certainly could. But, but I just didn't want to bring some friends into the process if they didn't want to come. And they really weren't anxious to get into the middle of this thing. But I've known Ann Richards for 25 years. I know a lot about her. And you used to be friends. Well, I think that we probably still are. And, 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 I, and I want something understood very clearly too that whether I win or lose this race tonight tomorrow I'll be out campaigning for the entire Democratic ticket is that an olive branch that is not an olive branch it's just a statement of my principles as a human being I believe in the Democratic Party and its principles and I'm gonna be after Clayton Williams then okay thank you Attorney General well Cindy Kennard is with the Richards campaign uh, Cindy do you think that uh, Ann Richards can forgive and forget what's been said Rice University sold this Houston mansion to former Governor Mark White and gave him more than a $1 million loan under highly unusual terms. Seven months after White left his $93,500 a year governor's job, Rice made him a short-term loan that requires only monthly interest payments. Rice also loaned White another quarter of a million dollars to renovate the house. White claims the home improvement loan was his down payment. Personally, when I've gone to buy a home, the one thing the lender always wants to be sure of is, is that I have not borrowed the down payment from anywhere. The lender was very pleased with this arrangement because of the enhancement of the value of the house. The lender is very aware of all the instruments associated with it, and they were very pleased with the interest rates and the return that they're getting on that home. I did it just like uh, other people in this country do. I borrowed the money. White says he pays an interest rate above current market rates and says the house was vacant for seven years. When asked about the deal, Rice University's treasurer curtly said, we don't discuss real estate transactions. We have no comment. Did Mark White enrich himself at the public's expense the last time he held office? Ann Richards, who is trying to shift attention away from her refusal to answer questions about illegal drug use, makes the mansion the target of a new attack ad. Then he took our tax money to line his own pockets. No wonder he could afford his own million-dollar mansion when he left the governor's office. Ann Richards needs to pull that ad down. It's wrong. It's a lie. White countered the charges by releasing only the first two pages of every federal income tax return filed since 1973. He will not disclose schedules required by the IRS that identify sources of income and deductions. The 1986 return lists White's total income at nearly $60,000 before his defeat as governor. In 1987, White's income soared to more than $800,000 after just 11 months in private law practice. Mark White was not a rich man when he entered the governor's office in 1983. The incomplete tax returns indicate that after 13 years of relatively low-paid public service, White quickly became wealthy enough to buy a million-dollar mansion. Robert Riggs, Channel 8 News, Austin. Amateur archaeologist Rusty Busby of Austin hunts for buried treasure from a Texas shrine. Deep in the San Antonio River bottom may rest the 150-year-old Alamo Cannon Mystery. Based on a diary written in May of 1836, historians believe that artillery from the Alamo was thrown into the river about here after the Mexican army learned of Santa Ana's defeat at the Battle of San Jacinto. 
Historians estimate 21 cannons defended the Alamo. 13 were recovered from a nearby ditch in 1852. A few years ago, the author of Raise the Titanic began searching for the missing Alamo cannon. This is the second expedition. Well, it's historical treasure is what it really amounts to. You can't put a dollar uh, amount on it like you could a bar of gold. But I mean, to, to actually see and touch, let's say, one of the cannon that were used by the Alamo defenders, I think would really be a marvelous uh, challenge, too. Searchers are encouraged that the river has not changed course. This bend would have been the closest place to dump heavy cannon. Volunteers sift through mud and gravel for artifacts. They take advantage of low water while the river walk is drained for repairs. We're uncovering the last 200 years of history, in particular, in some cases, 2,000 years. It, it's, uh, yeah, it gives me some goosebumps. The excavation has yielded a collection of turn-of-the-century bottles, including a rare product by the inventor of bottled beer, Spanish colonial pottery, and a Civil War era inkwell. They have been trash until uh, we, we found it. If, if it tells us something about the people that used to live here and what they used, it gives us a glimpse into what their lives may have been like. Rusty Busby kept hoping his shovel would strike the Alamo cannon. For now, it appears the mystery will remain unsolved. But archaeologists vow to make this a yearly search over the next decade. Robert Riggs, Channel 8 News, San Antonio. Channel 8's Robert Riggs joins us now live from our Austin Bureau with the latest. Robert? Well, Lisa, the last special session failed over the price tag of school equalization. The first year's cost ranged from $200 million to more than $1 billion. That would mean a tax increase for certain. And today, lawmakers started looking at a state lottery as a way out of the crisis. A lottery could raise an estimated $600 million. Its final approval would require passage of a constitutional amendment by the state's voters. But opponents still don't think a lottery can even win in the House. Uh, state government ought not to be involved as an active participant, an active encourager and promoter of seeing citizens gamble their money away. Uh, well, this afternoon, the Senate Education and Finance Committee quickly passed the same equity bill that it passed in the last special session. It would spend more than $1 billion next year alone. Now, senators complain that Governor Clements has not provided leadership during the special sessions. Well, Governor Clements vows to veto any tax bill. Well, this session appears to have started on a collision course with a governor that could ultimately shut down Texas schools. Chip? All right. Thank you very much, Robert. Former Governor Mark White blazes the comeback trail in the Rio Grande Valley. White must overcome the memory of broken pledges and general dislike that turned him out of office three years ago. I see no reason for increasing the taxes paid by the people of Texas. Some say this may cost us our jobs, and it might. I know what I'm asking you to do when I call for a tax increase. And to those who try to blame you, for what we do here, tell them we had to do it. Blame me. And they did. Mark White went into forced political retirement practicing law in Houston. Were the voters of Texas wrong, or has Mark White changed? No, I don't think the voters are wrong. I just think that I didn't do a good enough job explaining some of the things that we were trying to do. Mark White had trouble explaining his education reforms, especially a no-pass, no-play rule that caused a public outcry on Friday night gridirons. You made us a political pawn. Mark White going, going, gone. Teachers rebelled after they had to take a competency test that amounted to little more than a basic literacy quiz. And I think I may have been one of the only ones that lost their job over that test. <laughs> Three years later, some teachers still don't find the test a laughing matter. It's been real, real difficult on us, and uh, we've never forgotten it. And I know many of my teacher friends are still feel the same way. There was an image that Mark White would first sample the winds of public opinions and then follow the polls. Well, if you think I did that, you'd think that uh, we'd had better success in the election. I took the hard choice. I made the decisions that were the tough ones. Part of Mark's problem the whole time he was governor was that he would generally, in the end, do the right thing. 
But he would take so long to do it, by the time he got around to doing it, he got very little credit for it. Mark White is now trying to get credit where credit is due, for more students passing achievement tests, higher teacher salaries, and smaller classes. The results of a nearly $4 billion increase in education spending under his administration. But no pass, no play continued to dog white when he told Donna High School seniors he favored exempting students enrolled in difficult honors classes. I myself, as an honors student, and a bunch of us that are honors students in the class of 1990 here at Donna High School, feel insulted by the concessions that you would make to have us with no pass, no play. White says the students' critical questions prove his educational reforms are working. And getting those reforms passed, he says, was worth the price he had to pay at the ballot box. Now he campaigns on the theme that much more can and needs to be done in education without raising taxes. Uh, is it wise for any politician to make pledges that they won't raise taxes? If you will make certain that the price of oil stays where it is today, if you'll make certain that all those economic indicators stay just like they are, you won't need any new taxes. I can guarantee you that. There's plenty of money. Mark White was the Velcro governor. Everything negative stuck. He's got to convince voters that in hindsight, Mark White's years as governor looked a lot better. But a campaign pledge once broken is not one that's easily forgotten. Robert Riggs, Channel 8 News, Austin.